Hey, greetings, everybody. I'm Nate Angel from Hypothesis. You may have seen me around the, the event already. Um, and I'm really, really happy to be here today with a couple of different uh, folks. Um, oh, school. Oh. <laughs> I'm just going to uh, just going to mute Cheryl for a second there. She just arrived. And so just getting her audio sorted out. Um, so uh, really happy to be here. I just wanted to set the stage a little bit for what's happening here. This um, educator office hours are meant to be a really kind of informal, casual session where we've invited a couple of educators who have some, you know, deeper experience with social annotation to just come have a casual conversation with um, other folks who um, who might have questions or thoughts, maybe talking about pedagogy a little bit. Um, every day we also have a separate hypothesis 101 session that where you can go for like kind of deeper technical questions. So. Maybe the idea here is to talk a little bit more about practices, educational practices and stuff, but hey, it's casual, so anything is all right. Um, and I just wanted to say that I'm joined here, and thank you so much for coming, uh, by Holly Benson, who's at um, Muskegon Community College, and also Cheryl Swain um, from Temple University. I'm a big Philly fan, so um, really happy to, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to disregard Muskegon at all, but um, I have a personal connection to Philly, so I had to say that. Um, so welcome to both of you. I'm really glad that you could be here, and I thought we might just kick things off just so people can learn a little bit about you. If we could hear, you know, just a brief introduction about you, like where you work, what you do, and then maybe like how you got involved with social annotation and what you've been doing with it, and I thought if it's okay, uh, Holly, we might start with you. Sure. Hello, thank you for having me at this I Annotate conference. Um, I teach reading and college success seminar at Muskegon Community College. So I typically have the students who are the least prepared for college when they come. And before the pandemic, I started having students annotate everything they read for reading class. And I just found that it made a tremendous difference because one, they actually had to read it because they had to show me something that they'd written down, but then also they were engaging with the text. So when the pandemic hit and we moved to remote in March of 2020, I tried to carry on with that and had students take pictures of their annotations and submit them or email them to me, which was really cumbersome. And then as I was reading about what other educators are doing around the country, I read about hypothesis and I was so excited. Um, and then they had the, where we could pilot it. So we piloted it for a semester and it went great. And then I convinced my college to subscribe to it. So I'm really excited that we're continuing with it. Um, and for reading and college success seminar, um, at the same time, we were considering going to an OER text. And so I thought, well, we're doing all kinds of change anyway with the pandemic. So let's just do the OER too. So um, plus we wanted to help students because it was tough financial times for everyone. So buying a book was just another issue for them. So it worked fantastic with the OER. We would take each chapter and I would save it as a PDF and put it in Blackboard and then students could annotate right on the text. And I used that to replace a lot of discussions. Um, and I'm now teaching my classes. I think I'll continue to do hybrid because I love hypothesis for that interaction with the text. Whereas before I thought there's no way with dev ed that we can do online. Um, and I really like doing the synchronous online about two thirds and then asynchronous online using hypothesis to replace a lot of discussion boards for the other part of it. So I'm a big fan. Wow, that's really great. And I, and I wanna come back to that uh, open OER for college success too, because that's near and dear to my heart as well. Um, well, let's let's uh, get an introduction from, from Cheryl then and like hear a little bit about you and how you got involved with social annotation and what you're doing with it. Sure. So um, I'm an associate professor at Temple University, and I'm also the associate director um, of the Intellectual Heritage Program at Temple. I teach in that program as well. And it's a humanities core text based course uh, that you know, is really reading intensive, uh, to be frank. And, and some of the reading is quite challenging. In fact, I was just hopping uh, from a professional development uh, program that I'm, I'm working on with our faculty on Marx and um, Capital and the Communist Manifesto. And um, 
I also have been teaching online for several years um, prior to the pandemic, um, asynchronously primarily, and then during the pandemic uh, synchronously. And I found my way to Hypothesis uh, through Rap Genius. So I'm an, a longtime annotator um, who, uh, along with Jeremy and a bunch of other folks, kind of hacked uh, Rap Genius where uh, you know, music lovers were annotating rap lyrics and used it uh, to annotate things like the Tao Te Ching or anything else that was in the public domain. Uh, so I was, of course, you know, first really sad when when Lit Genius disappeared, and then extremely happy that um, Hypothesis came to be. Um, so yes, full disclosure, I'm a I'm a big fan and a longtime stan. And um, you know, like Holly, we are uh, we did a very a kind of mini micro pilot. Um, I have hypothesis last semester in the intellectual heritage program, and it met with great success. And I am in, currently trying to talk to the powers that be uh, at, at Temple, which is a very large uh, research university, to to adopt it uh, university wide. But if not, then at least program wide. Um, in our courses, they are seminar style courses. Uh, you know, twenty to twenty eight students. Uh, moving to an online space, either synchronously or asynchronously, uh, provided a tremendous amount of challenge. And especially with all the Zoom fatigue out there, uh, I found that Hypothesis was a really powerful social space for um, shared knowledge to occur. And my students agreed. I have to say, uh, never before have I had so many students uh, confess to doing all the reading and enjoying it um, as they have since adopting Hypothesis. And Holly, like you in the past, I had, I've always been a, a believer in annotation and I used to have students, um, I would do like pop quizzes. I would, uh, you know, they'd come in and I'd say, okay, now just take a picture of these five pages of your text. Let me see your annotations. And um, we're in fact in, in our professional development um, program this week, uh, going to be doing a whole session on hypothesis and social annotation. So um, I, I think that's probably enough said. So. Wow, that's so great. I'm so happy to have you both here. Um, and uh, thank you to Jeremy for rounding you up um, and convince strong arming you, hopefully not too much to, to join. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to add a link, um, I think, to what I believe is the program that you were talking about at Temple, Cheryl, um, mm -hmm. and I also added one for Holly there so folks can see a little bit of your institutional backgrounds. Yep. Um, so uh, I am going to just keep the conversation going until someone from the audience um, kind of chimes in with a question or comment or something that they'd like to steer the direction of the conversation toward. I, I noticed that Alex had uh, was kind of responding to Holly um, talking about, uh, you know, how the learners reacted to to the move to social annotation. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to, I know you answered that a little bit in chat, Holly, but I, I kind of wanted to follow up on that because it, I've always felt like student success is really, not to indoctrinate people, but it's such a great time to, um, you know, put people in touch with practices that may help them out um, as they're moving through their college, you know, experience overall. And, you know, as somebody who believes that social annotation can really help you in a variety of different environments, I've always felt like college success is the maybe the single most important place to get it going. And so I'm wondering, um, so you're a hero of mine, obviously. And so I'm wondering, um, did you find that, um, that, uh, that uh, when when your learners were coming into the environment, were you finding that they had already had experience with any kind of annotation activity before, or was it pretty much is it pretty much new to them? And if so, does it seem like it's something that I don't know? Maybe it's too early to tell, but is something that may be aiding their their forward path in college success in general? So sorry, my dogs are barking. If you can hear them in there, I don't stare. That's all right. It's, it's not too. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, many of them have been exposed to it. Actually, it's, you know, I'm trained as an educator. I taught K-12 before. So I like, I knew all these strategies and taught them to students, but then you get to college and you kind of think like, well, students already know strategies, so you don't want to treat them like kids and, you know, would try to teach them sort of different strategies. And my daughter, um, 
she's now just finished ninth grade, but in her middle school, they made her annotate everything. And I thought, oh my gosh, why am I not making my students do this still? It's such an excellent strategy. How could I have sort of forgotten about it, you know? Um, so I think they're doing it more in schools in Michigan, at least now, but students may not have heard the term annotation. So um, they always are intimidated by that. And they like, Stum stumble over pronouncing it, particularly in the reading class. And our college success seminar is required for students who test into two or more dev ed courses. So um, they feel intimidated. But once I, you know, point out, well, a and is add and note is notes. So you're just adding notes to the writing and it's really a conversation and I model it for them. Then they're more accepting of it. And we start right out with the syllabus and I add some annotations to it to begin with, you know, like I have my name and I say, please call me Holly. And, you know, about contacting me, I really am good about getting back to people. So setting that friendly tone for them to get them going. Um, and then they, they're pretty receptive to it. And then they get nice conversations going too. Um, so that part I think works really well. And then I definitely find that um, by the end, I have them do a reflection. They talk about how it really is a strategy they'll keep using. And I know in the beginning, they just think, oh, I have to do annotations and I actually have to read it. You're going to make me read it. And um, but they really do by the end like it. Now, of course, I can't say that every single student just loves it by the end. And they're, you know, great, great readers who like it. But they um, they they understand the importance of it by the end. Yeah, I think I, I have some learners in my house, too, that are seem to have been forced to do some annotation that's much more like um, it seems like busy work to them and it doesn't have that welping, welcoming kind of conversational aspect that you're talking about. It doesn't, it's more like a, you know, the kind of annotated bibliography kind of move that seemed like a really onerous, you know, a highly academic task as opposed to some sort of like shared conversation around a text. Um, so that that really resonates with with how I've seen it. And I think that that setting of the stage that you talk about must be such an important part of it. I wonder, Cheryl, if you did you want to riff on a little bit on what Holly was saying? I thought I could see you doing a lot. Yeah, yeah I mean, it sounds like we, you know, we are kind of taking a, you know, same approach. Uh, I think that especially with the syllabus, you know, syllabus day, uh, whether it's in person or online, is maybe the most dreaded day of all uh, professors because it's so flat and unengaging. And I found um, asking my students to annotate the syllabus uh, by putting questions in, by, I, you know, I always identify the learning goals for the course. I ask them which one uh, was most meaningful to them, what they, they hoped they would gain, uh, what's missing from the course, what's surprising um, about it. And, and it really set an amazing tone from the beginning that was very different from how that first day uh, can sometimes go, especially in an online setting. So, um, you know, I've found across the board that the, the, and especially just the kind of beautiful light interface of Hypothesis allows for a kind of free flowing conversation, um, almost like a back channel. Uh, which students are so comfortable using as learners. And it's something that I don't think we fully tapped into as educators yet um, in a positive way. You know, they're always texting or in a group me or here even, you know, everyone's on the chat. I see you out of the corner of my eye on the chat, people. Um, and that's a good thing, right? And so um, social annotation or, or hypothesis almost becomes a kind of uh, it had a back channel vibe, at least this semester. It was a place where students uh, were being very real and authentic in their conversation uh, with me and one another and even in their reflections. Um, that seems like it could get really interesting, especially if the reading is, you know, Das Kapital or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, and I've found too, uh, in order to kind of, Nate, speak to that issue of annotation as busy work, um, I do think you're right that it, it really is important to be intentional in the ways in which you're asking students to annotate and uh, sometimes, and sometimes in leaving it very open so that they can kind of make their own connection and negotiation with both the tool and the text in each other. Um, and for me, I, I kind of balanced the semester out where, you know, one, one we had sort of a um, a routine or ritual with annotation for the first round through a text. And then um, usually I tried to do something kind of 
innovative or different uh, the second time that we engaged with the reading, whether I was asking students to revisit old notes uh, of their own or to find something that a classmate had uh, noted that we wanted to pull into a new text, uh, to making contemporary connections and adding, you know, gifs and or gifs. I never know. I never. I never it's know. both. I think. I think it is both. Yeah. So, um, so at any at any rate, the 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 biggest takeaway I've had is that I feel like it really humanizes uh, both the text and the educational space instead of um, being a kind of busy work or alienating task. I love that idea of it humanizing the text. I mean, obviously humanizing humanizing the classroom is awesome as well, but that, you know, books, they, they can come across as so dead sometimes, mm -hmm. right? It's like written by a dead person. Well, and Holly, I wonder if this was, if you if you experienced this, but, um, you know, I was working, I work with a, a wide range of t types of students at Temple from uh, first generation college students to, um, you know, non-traditional aged learners to uh, honor students in what amounts to an honors college. And um, again, one of the things that I think can be so powerful about uh, digital education uh, that can sometimes get lost in the brick and mortar space uh, is role modeling and also a kind of sense of building a sense of belonging. And the thing that I noticed about uh, my, our use of hypothesis in the class is that it was very affirming for students. Uh, you know, if, if I if I said, you know, on this round of annotations, just identify the things that are confusing. I don't want you to try to figure out why they're confusing or to try to help each other even at this point. Just what's messing you up? Where are you getting stu stuck? Uh, and and for, for learners to see that they're not alone um, or in the inverse for them to see that, oh, wait, I think I got that part. Maybe I'll be able to help this person. Um, again, it's really, it's, it's powerful. Um, to be a little bit transparent uh, on where you're stumbling, you know, because sometimes I think the the biggest challenge with reading, especially with difficult reading, is to not be able to identify, you know, what's causing the lack of comprehension. Yes, that's a, a good point, Cheryl. I have noticed that too, and I do have a, a higher level reading class for students have, who have met the basic competency but are trying to get into our nursing program, which has a higher level. Um, and this semester, it's been delightful that students feel comfortable asking questions when they don't understand something in the text. And then I can go right in there and answer them at the basic concept or paragraph or sentence level, which in the classroom, you, you wouldn't really get that because I think they would be too embarrassed face to face to say, I don't understand what they're really talking about with this mm -hmm. term. Um, but in there, they can do it and it's public and other, other students see it and they may answer it at, or I may answer it too. So I do love that aspect of it. Um, I did see a question in the chat from Michael about um, the balance of informal interaction with requirements. And you did adjust, address that a little bit, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. um, I do the same where sometimes, you know, like the syllabus, it's more getting to know you. And I tell them it's to become familiar with what's expected because I never want to surprise them with anything that they didn't know they were supposed to do. Um, but other times it is more that they need to identify specific things in the text. Um, so I think setting the stage first for the, the safe space and a, a comfortable space is important and then you can get into more of that. But actually, I'm going to pull one of um, one of the questions that came in the queue and a right here on stage. Um, from Alex, because I think it really pertains to what you were just talking about, Holly, you know, about the degree to which uh, annot social annotation can make the, the process of reading and, and reading in a class more inclusive, not only across this divide of, of being in the classroom face to face versus not, which you just mentioned, right? So there's a kind of inclusivity of space and time and mode that can happen, but also for different kinds of people. I, I wonder if, yeah, I don't know who to ask first, but do you guys have thoughts about that? Holly, you want to go first? <laughs> um, no, you can go ahead. I have to think about it for a second. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that one of the things this this pandemic has kind of laid bare for us are the the ways in which we can always do more to design inclusively uh, for a range of learners um, from uh, thinking inclusively about uh, the digital divide in terms of socioeconomics to uh, cultural divide to learning differences, 
Um, and the, you know, I've just found that the more modalities that I can em employ, uh, the more inclusive the space. And what's nice about social annotation is that um, it does, you know, for, in terms of access, first of all, make things really wonderful for students. They thanked me across the board uh, for keeping costs down um, and providing access to either um, appropriately, uh, you know, legally portioned uh, excerpts of text or full text where where it was available, um, you know, in the common um, domain. Um, but then also, I think that, that students, and I think I mentioned this before, you know, Zoom is fatiguing and um, it can be a difficult space uh, for students to uh, participate in conversation with one another uh, because of issues of social anxiety um, uh, or, or something else. And so um, the hypothesis space allows for those types of in inclusive moments in a way that discussion forums don't as well because um, discussion forums are difficult to set up uh, where you feel like you're clustering around a moment or an idea um, and you know the hypothesis allows for that space uh, also the fact that you can do you know some really uh, clever searching using hashtags uh, can allow students who uh, need to organize information differently to do that. Um, it can, you know, they can search uh, for a particular term or concept. Um, so I think that there are a lot of applications when we think about inclusive design um, that we can find a tool like Hypothesis to be invaluable. I agree, Cheryl. And using the OER is like the first yeah. huge step forward in inclusivity because we always had students who did not have a book that, you know, and, you, you know, and there were some who would come to me and they'd say, I just really can't afford it. Like my other, even though ours was inexpensive, they would have other ones that cost more and they would say, well, I really have to buy my biology book first, which is $100 and or $150. So I'm waiting to buy this book. And, you know, I would have an old version, but it just wasn't the same. So making sure they all have the text right there. I love to eliminate excuses. I'm a you know, very understanding, flexible person, but eliminating as many excuses as I can is mm -hmm. something I love to do. Um, so having that right there for all of them is great. I also so much prefer hypothesis to discussion boards. I really only use discussions when it's something very specific where they have to write more about their own experience or something else. So they don't have to take something from the text and carry it over to the discussion board and then try to create a discussion about it and explain the context and all of that. Also, although we want students to write really well and be really literate, it also removes a lot of the judgment because it's more like texting where you can do just a short annotation and that's okay. And um, I always cringe for students who, you know, they're doing a discussion board and their, their writing is just terrible. Um, and it's out there for everybody to see but they can still have intelligent thoughts and engage with the text and share with other students. So I like that aspect of it too. Yeah, and I think in the chat, Alex is bringing up something that is kind of a, a pet project of mine, which is helping students really see themselves as a type of public intellectual. And I found that their writing and their thinking and their critical analysis, uh, um, as, it, as it becomes more authentic and um, as these, these um, activities are, uh, uh, enacted for a real audience who matters rather than just for a grade uh, or for a teacher behind some kind of wall, whether it's submitting it through an LMS or handing in a typed paper or whatever it is, um, you know, it, it matters more to them as well. And um, that learning becomes significant uh, and, and something that they then are able to, to take outside of the classroom space, which is so important. Um, so. Yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm loving this conversation too. I, 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 I probably Jeremy designed this, but we really have the, you guys together are encountering the full range of at least college students, right? All the way from people just really starting out who maybe even aren't fully prepared for college level classes yet, all the way to folks grappling with, you know, uh, per, some pretty heady advanced stuff. It sounds like it in your work, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. And I, I love this idea that I was hearing when Holly was talking a little bit about you know, breaking down the act of reading and therefore of writing too into just little nuggets that could be, that will be informal to start with maybe, which is how we think, right? Like we don't, 
unless you're British, maybe you don't think in perfectly formed paragraphs with proper punctuation and citations. <laughs> At least I never have been able to. And so I, I, this idea of lowering the stakes so that you know your reading process and then th therefore maybe your writing process too can be a bunch of little nuggets strung together as opposed to some gigantic you know project that has has yet to be done and is that is that it sounds like that's what holly what you're finding in your practices is that that informality enables people to kind of climb up the scaffolding to something else does that make sense definitely and i'm sure that i have some students who before would have been too intimidated if they had to read something and then write a discussion board post about it but if they're really struggling, I can meet with them individually on Zoom and we can go through it together and, you know, they can share a screen or I can and we go through and we add some annotations together and they do a few and they're like, oh, this is easy. I can do this. Um, where they, you know, first they're just being asked to interact and instead of, like you said, having to form some huge, fully developed thought that they have to share with the world in finished form. I, I just, sorry, Cheryl, I'll, I just... Yeah. I can't believe I never thought of this before, this idea of sharing screens and being like, let's annotate together for a little while first. Like, that's brilliant. I don't know why I never thought of that. No, that's okay. It is It is brilliant. I don't think that, I don't think that we did that. I, I haven't done that. I've pulled the annotations into Zoom. In other words, I'll share my screen and we'll use, we'll say, all right, you know, here's where the interest was this week. And I might ask a student in Zoom to, you know, students to talk about, you know, something that interested them. And if you're met with silence, then you can pull up. I'll say, well, let's just, let's see what you all were talking about in hypothesis. And, um, and then we can go there and, and showcase and highlight some, some of the ideas and discussions that are going on and pull them uh, into the live classroom. And I do plan on continuing that in face-to-face -face class as well, sharing, sharing a hypothesis screen, um, you know, continuing the conversation, pulling it into the brick and mortar space. Um, I can also say for me as, uh, you know, in teaching difficult texts that it's been wonderful to uh, get a sense of where understanding breaks down before having to step into the classroom, um, you know, to, to kind of really tailor the conversation, the supplemental context, you know, whatever it is students need. Um, I'm really meeting them where they're at now, uh, rather than where I perceive them to be. Um, and I think that that is a, another kind of, it wasn't really something that I was considering when adopting using Hypothesis, how as a tool it would really help me also get uh, insight into my students' thinking, um, but it has. Uh, so it's it's really made the classroom time very valuable, almost like a flipped space in some ways. Just to circle back, I during the the first class session, I always pull up hypothesis in on share screen in Zoom, pull it up, and have them get in and annotate at the same time. Then I can say, "Oh, I see that Cheryl added this. Good job, Cheryl. You got an annotation in there. Oh, there's Nate's. You know, oh. and um, talking them through it and making sure they get them in there and showing them. And then also, I too have found that it really enriches the classroom discussion because I can look and I can say, I noticed this is something you were talking about. Or if no one's talking, I could say, well, Cheryl, could you say more about what you put in the annotation about yeah. this? And so yeah, and that, that really, you know, then going to the inclu inclusive design um, piece again, you know, then we really are leaning into um, the power of, you know, our introverts, right? The individuals who aren't necessarily going to be the first to raise their hand and just start talking or sharing an idea um, like our extroverts will, but the the synthesizers um, and the, the thinkers who um, are really kind of taking their time to come to an understanding or to share an insight and hypothesis allows for that. Uh, whereas in a 50 minute class, whether it's on Zoom or face to face, you know, that isn't possible for some students. So, Yeah, that's I mean, we we came up with this phrase, it's really Jeremy and I in conversation about how social annotation makes reading active, visible and social. Mm -hmm. And you'll see we you see we use that a lot because we really felt like it distilled down like three of the superpowers that one gains with social annotation, you know, that the way that reading stops becoming that kind of passive solitary act and then um, how there becomes a, a trail of it, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, 
then how multiple people can kind of join onto that trail. Um, and it's everything I'm hearing you guys say just kind of comes back to resonate with that. Um, uh, really enjoying the discussion here. There's a couple more questions that have popped up if, if you wouldn't mind switching gears a little bit, but I don't want to interrupt if somebody had more to say on that thread. <laughs> um, okay, so um, another question that we have up here, and this is really, really shifting the gears a little bit is around, um, it's actually from our, our colleague, Rami Collier about, we've been talking a lot about what's been happening, or you've been talking about your practices during this last pandemic year. So here we go, here we go into a new school year, possibly with differences. Uh, are you thinking of using social annotation in your courses in the fall? And I don't know, maybe Cheryl, you wanna start um, with that just so that mm -hmm. I pick someone? Yeah, sure, yes, absolutely, <laughs> hands down. So um, I, I absolutely will be using it. I think that, um, I'm also really, I'm nervous to do this, but I'm, I'm trying very hard to embrace ungrading principles as much as possible um, this coming semester, uh, just after how my university was addressing some of the issues during the pandemic. And I, I found that students uh, really were exhibiting more of a growth mindset in an environment where there were no stakes, uh, not just low stakes. and um, and so I do plan on using it. My my hope is that I'll have it set up so we'll again have maybe two or three passes through a text using a hypothesis uh, per week or per per two week cycle, depending on the reading. Uh, whereas the first uh, touch will probably be a little bit more traditional, um, where I might begin by uh, having a few prompts um, for students to look for sort of specific things in the text and and share what they find. Um, to a second pass through where I might put them into groups and ask them to kind of function almost like a literature circle, if people are familiar with those, where one group might be focusing on um, difficult terminology and finding uh, definitions or applications. One group might focus on character and character development. One group might focus on uh, making connections to our world today, finding articles in the news or in popular culture. Um, and then a third, more reflective uh, type of annotation where, where students will have the opportunity maybe once every two weeks to go back and look through their annotations to kind of map their growth or see what kind of interests are developing for themselves. Are they noticing that they, they tend to kind of always focus on a particular type of annotation or a particular theme or topic? So um, those are my, off, off the top of my head, my ideas in terms of uh, annotation, annotating rituals or rhythms for the semester. Um, it might change, but right now that's where I'm headed. Interesting, what, what about you, Holly? Look, thank you for default. <laughs> I'm definitely planning on using hypothesis again. I'm the coordinator for our college success seminar course, so I build like our basic shell and then people can customize. But we are planning on having them read and annotate every chapter of the OER text, which just as a side note related to reading, um, I had students at the end of fall when I asked them, what did you think of the, the book? Several said to me, we had a book. So at first I thought, oh my gosh, that's bad. They didn't know they had a book, but actually I think it's probably kind of good because maybe they saw it as less of this huge insurmountable task to, to read a whole book. And it's a massive textbook that we started out with. It's the OpenStax College Success Book, which we're now on like editing the third version and customizing it more for our college. Um, so I definitely plan to use that and then um, I've shifted to integrated reading and writing instead of just developmental reading separately. Um, so I love the flexibility of finding what's appropriate for the students to annotate. So I don't have a like a single text that I'm using for that when I'm pulling in appropriate things for the students, which I, the flexibility is awesome. And really largely because of hypothesis, I'm planning on even when I'm back face to face doing hybrid for all of my classes, because I mean, that's really quality learning time when they're in there socially annotating. Mm -hmm. And so when you say integrated reading and writing, does that mean these are courses where students are kind of working on both of those skill sets together? Just yes. make sure I have that right. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. um, that's That sounds great because I mean, so many, I've heard so many people report that, um, that learning how to read in a different way 
the very next thing that it does is empower your writing, right? And that that jump from reading to writing is is really the the missing link <laughs> in a lot of a lot of people's work. Is that does that that sounds like where you're headed? Yes, and I'm this past year I did it as a an exploratory course to see, and we're working out different things at our college with um, placement because um, this is a complete aside from hypothesis, but when you have your whole placement structure set up for reading and writing separately, and then you add an integrated course that sort of throws a wrench in the works. So <laughs> we're working on all of that um, across departments to figure it out, but um, I think students benefit a lot more when those skills are together. You can't really isolate them. Yeah, well, are you guys ready for another swerve? Because I could take this in a whole new direction from an audience, audience remark. So I'm gonna bring this one up um, from Chris. And so I, I don't think we've exclusively been talking about annotation inside an LMS, because I get the feeling that at least some of Cheryl's work is, is outside the LMS. Um, but, and I'm just gonna start off with a caveat that Hypothesis knows that we've created a little bit of a monster here in the sense that the first thing that we brought into the world was this, calling it a web application, yeah. right? Where anybody can go create an account and start annotating in the web, either publicly or in a private group. So that's outside the LMS and on the open web. We sometimes say in the wild, right? And there's all sorts of things that can happen there, but there's also a lot of friction in getting that going and having it work and, you know, um, also navigating uh, levels of privacy that you might want to have with a class and then maybe not have later or something like that. And then of course, as we all know, many colleges and universities and uh, K-12 schools as well, you know, use LMSs and have very um, strong desires around using them in particular ways. And so it wasn't until we actually made an LMS integration that we started to see uh, usage really explode even more widely than it was because it made it easier for uh, colleges and universities to adopt and teachers and students to start to use it, right? But there's things that are available out in the wild that aren't available inside the LMS, uh, like the tagging and searching features that Cheryl was talking about aren't, as, uh, aren't yet as readily available in the LMS, um, but headed there. And then there's this issue too of sewing it together, like maybe you've done some work in a classroom environment inside an LMS, but then you want to expand that out and cross the boundary to another class or, or cross the boundary even outside of your your yes. uh, your learning uh, experience into your quote unquote real life. And so we're, it is our vision to try to sew those experiences together so that people can actually have the inside the LMS experience when it's appropriate, but then also take that outside when, when that works too. So that was a little preamble to this to give you guys a little time to think about it too. But I'm wondering, Cheryl, if you might, this I'm thinking this might resonate with some of the work that you've done this question from Chris. And so uh, maybe not, but I'll let, you, I'll let you riff on it. Well, it did. I mean, prior to you all building it in the LMS, I, you know, like I said, from a long time ago, I was, I was using, um, you know, the Genius platform. Um, and then as soon as, as soon as uh, Lit Genius went away and I got a little note that there would be an extension that you could add to your browser and you can create groups and put students in those groups and, and um, annotate the web that way. Yes, absolutely. We were doing that. I was doing that more, um, more so uh, in, in a, a course that I taught that ask student to ident students to identify uh, social, you know, big social problems or messes that we're facing today as a society and, um, and then uh, kind of connecting the text to those messes. So it was almost an inverse annotation. I, I, we weren't annotating text, but we're just like life, you know. Um, and now that it's in the LMS, I, you know, because of privacy issues, I do feel more confident and comfortable using it robustly in the classroom, whereas before it was really kind of a light touch use because of my nervousness around uh, digital fingerprints and, and student privacy. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question. Um, uh, so, so next semester, no, I'm not, I'm not doing, I am just sticking uh, hopefully with hypothesis in the learning management system unless our university is, doesn't adopt it and then I have to go <laughs> some crazier space. Than, We'll see what happens, but um, for now, I, I think um, I like that. I, for those of you that have been using Hypothesis or thinking about it in in the LMS, I know one thing that my students were 
frustrated about for a little while was that they did want to have you know easy access to their annotations um, and I sometimes wanted to aggregate them um, and so there are ways to do that I've learned uh, that you can hit I think Nate command P to uh, kind of save annotations as a PDF on a particular text and I think hypothesis is working um, really hard from what um, I was told on making that kind of uh, data and information more accessible for students to kind of hold and take with them. Yeah, there's um, we're definitely um, there's all sorts of things down in the weeds here, but they're so important too. Um, so the the need to like when you have that text in front of you and all the beautiful annotations and the highlights and everything and the need to try to capture that in some way actually turns out to be one of the most complex problems that we're faced with. Um, especially, I mean, to to do a kind of screenshot type thing like you're talking about, Cheryl, is probably the only really feasible way to do it right now, because to bring the text and the annotations, which are really separate entities living in separate worlds that are just kind of on top of each other temporarily together into some sort of permanent thing or possibly printable thing is actually pretty hard, except to the degree that it could be captured as an image, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's that's a real problem, and I can't promise any magic there. But on the other thing that you were talking about, which is, you know, outside in the wild, every Hypothesis user has their user profile page, right, where all their annotations are collected together, and you can search and navigate not only your own annotations, but other annotations that you might have access to that are either public or in groups that you belong to or whatever, and there's the tagging, and there's all sorts of features there. Um, we are just kind of experimenting with and putting the fi finishing touches now on the start of that experience for inside the LMS. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> so, yeah. but the only thing there is that once again, inside the LMS, the experience is kind of you know, within the class, the class and the classroom. So it's it's a narrower in that sense. It's not the whole universe of annotation. It's the universe of annotations within that class. So um, that's that's at least a start. Um, but Chris is right. I mean, my students are kind of addicted to it now. So they'll they'll you know email me and be like, Sal, and I want to annotate stuff I'm reading this summer. You know, what do I do? Like, how, how do I? What do yeah. I? Yeah. So. And that's the other thing I was talking about, right, where it's like maybe they have an independent account, mm -hmm. but that their independent account and their temple account could see each other and oh, the okay. annotation. Yeah. So that is a future thing that we also want to enable, but that's a little bit further away. <laughs> so that was that was a long. I'm making a lot of like hypothesis specific comments here, but um, but Holly, so are you are you primarily working inside the NLMS or is it outside? Inside. And that, you know, when I first learned about hypothesis and I learned that we could do it in the wild, as you call it, I considered it, but I quickly rejected it and went for the pilot and, con and then convinced the school to subscribe to it. Because when I used outside websites for students for things before, I spent so much more energy than I wanted to working out issues with the thing outside of Blackboard. And so having it in there where it was controlled and there wasn't a separate login and and I can troubleshoot is just so much better. Um, so, and also uh, particularly for developmental students or those who are just getting used to college, I think having things out there for the world would would not, not really be a good thing for them. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it in, I don't know if you folks know the work of Amanda LaCastro, who's another kind of um, educator who annotates a lot and <laughs> talks about it. She's now at Penn. So nearby to you, Cheryl, you guys should hang out. Um, <laughs> she uh, she used to be at uh, Stevenson, I think. Um, but at any rate, she, um, in her practices, she has often scaffolded things the way you're kind of thinking about Holly, maybe where your first set of annotation experiences might be in a very private, closed, structured environment, even if it's that one-to-one -one Zoom call you were talking about, right? To kind of get used to it, to get your feet wet and to start to understand what it looks like. And then as, people kind of advance through their practice, then she takes them out into the world and they get empowered with their own personal hypothesis account that they can take with them when they leave. And, but the two worlds are still kind of separate, but she treats it as a kind of as a kind of scaffolding to, in, in her work. I don't, I don't know if that kind of fits with, and obviously if you're just dealing with the developmental stage, you might only do the first part of that. Mm -hmm. um, but then hopefully by the time they're getting to a class that Cheryl might be working with, they would be ready for you know the more advanced stuff. 
Well, and even in my class, I do the one of the first things I do is is show students that they have the ability to have private and public annotations within the LMS space, and I encourage them uh, to take as many private to make as many private annotations as they want, and 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 let them know that they aren't going to waste because at any moment they're they're able to shift those to become a public facing. Um, annotation to the rest of the class um, and we talk a little bit about the kinds of private annotations that they might want to be taking um, as they're moving through the text versus the more um, directed public annotations so that I think that that's a important point that you know you want to help them feel safe and have a sense of mastery to a certain extent um, although I still think it's important in in the community of the classroom to showcase a little bit of vulnerability in their in their annotating uh, for one another. So. I just have a comment about the private annotations versus public. Um, I actually have not encouraged them to use the private ones very much and they often confuse it and probably part of it is just their whole outlook on education and not wanting other people to see their thoughts or feeling like they're not worthy. Mm -hmm. um, but it took me a while to figure out that some students were annotating, but they were making them private because they thought I could see private ones and you know not the class and they don't want other people to see that. Um, and then finally I, I figured it out and there were some who, you know, they kept saying, I know I did it, it's there, I can see it on my screen and then I couldn't see it on mine. And so that's just something to be aware of if you start using it to be really yes. clear with students about what private and public means. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and I just found myself talking to someone on Twitter about this too, because you'd think that private would be a separate thing from being in a group, but as Cheryl was sort of describing, it's like inside of every group, there's the possibility to have private annotations that you can then toggle to be visible to that group. That doesn't mean it toggles them to full visibility. If the group you happen to be working in is the in the wild public layer, then yes, they would be fully public. But anytime you're in a private group, um, you would just be toggling them to visibility within that group, like in the LMS or outside of it. Yeah, that's. I think that's, I've seen both cases, right, where people, it's like I entered a bunch of annotations and nobody ever saw them and I'm confused, like you're mentioning, Holly. But at the same time, Cheryl, it's like people can use it as a way to draft some first thinking and then maybe later expose it when it makes sense. So. Yeah, or, or, you know, one of the one of my goals for students is to really feel like these 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 books are theirs and, and that they they can have a special private relationship with the text that isn't necessarily um, connected to a performance of any kind. Um, and, and so I want to make sure that they have that option uh, where if they want to kind of practice or rehearse or, or make comments that really are just for them, um, you know, that, that that space is there as well. Yeah, and I see, um, is it Ofer uh, making a comment in the text about wanting the students to see themselves as experts of their own thinking and meaning making and really to own the book too, right? In a way, not not necessarily in the physical sense, but in the intellectual sense, right? So they feel like their relationship to the book is something of their own making as opposed to something that the teacher handed them or whatever, or Isaac Newton handed them. Yeah. Well, you know, that actually makes me think that um, I want to make two little plugs here for a couple of other things that are happening here at iAnnotate. Um, one is this, I see going through the chat, this kind of conversation around like, you know, what counts as an annotation, right? And getting people engaged in the idea of annotating, does it always have to be a piece of formal text on another piece of formal text or something? And um, as I'm sure you've seen on Thursday, oops, I have to get it right in the camera. Um, Ramey and Antero will be having a conversation um, at, at noon on Thursday, noon Eastern on Thursday around their book annotation. And um, this book does a really good job of, I think, starting to unpack the idea of annotation and how it can be many different kinds of things. And they've also been holding a really great Twitter, uh, a hashtag kind of conversation on Twitter around this where people are hashtagging um, uh, tweets that represent annotations of some kind, maybe they're a picture of something or something else, you know, something out in the real world, like you were talking, Cheryl, kind of reverse annotation mm -hmm. that ends up being an annotation itself or anything from a, a tattoo, 
to skywriting, to graffiti. You know, there's just so many different ways that the world presents us with opportunities to add an extra layer of meaning on top of it. And I think this book does a great job of kind of helping unpack that. And they're going to talk about it on Thursday at noon. So we should, we should um, think about that there. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is I make a plug for tomorrow's keynote where um, a couple of really special people, I mean, everybody here is special, but um, near and dear to my heart, um, Manuel Espinosa and, um, and Frida, whose name I'm blanking on right now, and I feel really bad um, because um, Frida Silva will, will be here from the Right to Dignity Lab. And this is a, a project that folks might not have heard about that might resonate with some of your guys' work where um, Manuel is a, is a teacher at the University of Colorado, Denver, and he works on a program called the Right to Dignity Lab, where he actually brings together students in um, sort of cohorts and groups, and their goal, they have a goal, and that goal is to amend the Colorado State Constitution to make education a human right. So the purpose of their class or classes is to do that. And they use annotation to do it um, in many ways. And you'll hear a lot more about that in the keynote tomorrow, but it's just an incredibly inspiring practice of, br of bridging that real world uh, kind of work into the classroom using annotation as the bridge because they're addressing a real world issue um, but then also using it to advance their own kind of intellectual pathways and take ownership over their own scholarship in a really um, eventually, hopefully public way. Yeah. And so a big plug for both of those. I, I hope you guys will be able to attend them. Are you going to are you folks going to be able to attend more of these sessions? They are being recorded, too, though. I'll have to hit the recording because I'll, I probably will be at that moment. Um, helping my faculty with uh, hypothesis and social annotation. So. Sadly, that seems like a good priority to have, though. <laughs> yeah. And I'll be teaching my students and discussing annotation. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> you guys are going to be hard at work. What's, what happened to that whole thing where teachers supposedly have the summer off and it doesn't exist, right? <laughs> yeah, my husband keeps asking me that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, we've been um, reacting to the audience here. We've heard from you guys. And I'm wondering, Holly and Cheryl, do you guys have... Do you guys have kind of questions or thoughts that you might have for some of the other people here about about anything that has been <laughs> working under your skin or bees in your bonnet? Think about it for a second. <laughs> you don't have to. Well, I did respond to it in the chat some. There was the, the side conversation about students annotating and whether we use models of, you know, famous geniuses and that sort of thing. Um, I think one of the, the great things about annotation in general and making it social in particular and hypothesis as the tool for it is it really um, is not just telling students but showing them that their thoughts matter and their thoughts are important and they're worth sharing with other people. Um, and for some of them, that's a new experience. So I, I really like that. Um, and I think I've only ever uh, kind of shown them um, medieval manuscripts and marginalia and the doodles and, and commentary uh, there to help students you know, to reinforce the idea that that reading is a conversation and that annotating is a, is a kind of way of bringing that conversation into a physical act, you know, to that you're not talking out loud to the book like you maybe sometimes you do when you read. I know I have, um, or certainly to movies, I've, I've talked out loud and screamed like, no, don't go in there. <laughs> you know? um, and um, again, if I imagine a kind of ideal reading practice, um, it's one that is engaged you know, in an embodied way and um, that allows there to be a conversation, uh, not just to, um, publish students' ideas with one another to show that they matter, but to show that they they can have a conversation with the author, that the author isn't necessarily an authority, uh, but somebody um, kind of presenting ideas that they want um, their readers to challenge uh, or be challenged by. And so if I show annotations by anyone famous, it's, it would only be to kind of exemplify, this is a conversation. Um, not this is how they do it, or this is how you should do it. 
yeah, I was amused. I think it was yesterday and, and yesterday's office hours with um, Lissandra. I think that's where it came up. We were talking about how it's kind of nice to read dead authors because you really feel like you can talk back to them <laughs> because they're dead, even though the canonized authors may seem a little more intimidating. So, you know, if you're going to annotate Isaac Newton, who has come up in the chat, maybe that's intimidating, but um, maybe annotation can be a way to empower empower you as a student or a, or a teacher, right? <laughs> Do you have you guys used annotation in your own kind of you know professional and scholarly practice outside of the teaching and learning part of things? Do you mean digital or do I like annotate? Well, things either through? actually, yeah. I mean, either way, annotation, annotation, annotation. I'll give you a visual. Hold on. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, outside of hypothesis, I have sticky note annotations, right? So I'm always annotating um, to, I don't know if you can see it here. You can't yeah, see them, but there's a lot of stuff stuck in there. Yeah, a lot of stuff stuck in there. So, um, you know, certainly for both, for both teaching and scholarship, um, that practice is important, whether it's through a digital tool um, or analog. Yeah. But I mean, I'm sort of stuck on this Twitter thing. I kind of can't get my mind around it. I, it never occurred to me that Twitter is a type of social annotation, but it totally is. And I don't, my mind's like a little bit, been a little bit blown for the last 20 minutes, wrapping my head around that. So I guess that's another way professionally, yes, that we annotate. I, I don't annotate things that I read for pleasure, but things that I read to learn, I annotate a lot. And just last week, as part of customizing our CSS text, we're including student stories and writing some of our own. And so I wrote about how, when I went to the University of Michigan after being in a, a small high school, I didn't have good study strategies and no one taught me to annotate, but I naturally started doing it for my Spanish literature classes because I would write translations and questions mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, and I'd like to say that I just immediately went, oh my gosh, I should do this for all my classes but I didn't, it took me time to learn to do that as a really good strategy. So I always tell my students, this is why I'm teaching you this now. It is so helpful and so important. Mm -hmm. And I do show them my books and how I still do it today. Yeah, that makes me wanna plug to our world languages um, panel that's gonna be on one of these days. I need to remember which one it is too, where we're actually gonna discuss annotation of texts in different languages and annotations in different languages as well. Um, so I can certainly understand that. Also, as a former Spanish literature major myself, hearts out to you. <laughs> Great stuff. Well, we've taken up a whole bunch of your time, and I know that, I mean, sounds like you guys actually still have a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to keep you too late. Um, any parting thoughts, um, Holly, before you, uh, you go back to lovely Muskegon? No, just thank you. Thank you so much. How about you, Cheryl? No, but feel free, anyone, you know, email me. I can share my email here. I'm happy to um, share assignments, prompts, help you think about a way to use hypothesis um, in your classroom. I'm, I'm, you know, a big, a big, big fan, and, and I am always looking for new approaches. So um, be in touch. That's Thank very you. generous of you. Yeah, of you both. Thank you so much. Um, and I would definitely, um, Holly, I'd love to hook you up with, I don't know if you know the folks over at Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York, who also um, went down the pathway of customizing OER for college success. I think that if I don't know if you have other colleagues who are, you've met who are working in that space, but I'd love to connect you and I can do that offline if you want. And yes, Cheryl, I, okay, great. Um, and Cheryl, if you want to, I could put you in touch with um, Amanda LaCastro at Penn, too, if you would like a, a local yeah, buddy. Yeah. Um, she's fantastic. She now works in the libraries at, at Penn. So, yeah, yeah she might um, know. I have a colleague who does instructional design at Penn who she might know, too. Um, so, I would love to network with her. She's just, I think she's just moving physically houses now as the job is new, but um, I'll put you in touch and yeah. we'll see where it goes from there. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for, for coming today. This was fantastic. I um, really loved the conversation. I learned a lot. Um, and I really appreciate you guys taking time to come today. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for the chat and your great questions.